I'm always curious about where people grow up and how they grow up and the kind of effect that that has, you know, that kind of, um, those formative years in a certain place, how that affects you and your work and your writing. And so I wanted to start with that. Well, I grew up in, in Fife, in the east coast of Scotland. Um, and Fife is, a, is an interesting place, uh, the kingdom of Fife, we call it. Um, and it's, it's separated really from the rest of Scotland by the Firth of Tay to the north and the Firth of Port to the south. Before we got the road bridges uh, connecting it in the 1960s, it was quite difficult to get to Fife. You had to make an effort, <laughs> and, and most people frankly didn't, uh, unless they were coming to play golf at St Andrews. St Andrews, incidentally, is not actually in Scotland. It's, it's actually in England, but it just happens geographically to be in Fife. But it's not really part of Scotland. Really? Um, and uh, anyway, I, I grew up in the real Fife. Um, it's very much a, a mining community. Um, both my grandfathers were miners. Um, my father started working at the shipyard things. He worked when I was born. Um, later ended up working for the town council. Um, it was a uh, sort of pretty uneventful childhood in many ways. You know, I, I often curse my parents for, for giving me a happy childhood. <laughs> <laughs> happy marriage, well brought up, but no major happened. problems something along happened. the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I discovered books is what happened. Um, my parents were very much of the generation that believed in improvement, in self-improvement. And that the way to escape from your working class background was, was from, through education. Um, my father was uh, an avid member of the, the Bow Hill People's Burns Club, which is, is not about you know, setting fire to things. Uh, it's about the poet Robert Burns, and, and they would meet monthly and celebrate the work of Burns. And these were, um, these were not educated people by any manner of means. They were mostly railway workers and miners, and they would meet to read the poetry of Burns and talk about it. And that the, the sort of politi the politics of Burns was very much imbued by my childhood. The notion of, of equality, um, the notion that uh, it didn't matter what stratum of society you were born into. What mattered was what you achieved with your life, what you did with your life, um, and that no, you know, call no man your master. And that turned out to be quite a useful way to live my life. I think um, my mother used to take me to the library from very early age, before I could read, but before I could even say library. Apparently I used to say I was going to Labrador, because <laughs> that was the kind of dog we had. Um, but as soon as I could, uh, was almost to get my own library ticket, I was very lucky because we had moved house to live across the street from the central library. So although books were a luxury we couldn't afford to buy in the house, I had constant access to a wide range of books. Um, and the thing is, in Scotland back in the 1960s, when I was small, um, it was still very much <coughs> a Presbyterian, straight-laced country. Uh, and although you could take four books at a time out of the library, two of them had to be non-fiction. How <laughs> <laughs> for fame, you should just have unmitigated pleasure. <laughs> um, so I ended up reading all sorts of things that I probably would otherwise not have looked at, you know, history and natural history, poetry, drama. Um, rather than just feeding myself on fiction all the time. Um, my big problem is tend to come at weekends when I was going to stay with my grandparents. And they lived in a little village where there was no library. Uh, there was a library bus that used to come around on Mondays, but I wasn't allowed on the library bus because I didn't actually live there. So I was like the kid at the sweet shop, you know, my face up against the glass <laughs> looking at the books that I wasn't allowed to touch. Um, and my grandparents were not readers at all. Um, I think they thought the devil would enter through your eyes if you read too much. You know? um, but they did, for some reason, no one's ever been able to explain, as well as their copy of the Bible, have a copy of Agatha Christie's Mother of the Vicarage. <laughs> and um, one of the things that the linguistic scientists tell us is that you can read Christie if you have a reading age of about nine. Um, and I think I was quite a precocious reader, so I was reading that from an early age. And whenever I ran out of books I brought with me, I reread the Mother of the Vicarage. And I was, I was deeply engaged with the plot. I think it was the storytelling. I love, I've always loved being told stories. And I loved the way that the story fitted together. The Murder at the Vicarage is the first Miss Marple novel. And it's beautifully constructed. It's got lots of different subplots and red herrings going on. So there's a lot happening in this book. And the figuring out, even though I've read it so many times, I can practically recite the first chapter off by heart. 
the figuring out of how it all came together fascinated me right from the very beginning, I think. And then, of course, I was delighted to see at that page at the beginning of the book that she'd read more, she'd read more than one. She right. <laughs> <laughs> so read quite a few books that I didn't go to and so I, wanted, I wanted to read more of these. But the problem then was that the, the, the books were in the adult library. Now, it's not like it is now, but, you know, all the books are out there, open shelves, open access, you can read anything you want at any time. And back then, the books in the adult library might as well have been behind the Berlin Wall. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm shooting librarians have machine gun posts. <laughs> so, is it not, is it not Can you hear? Yeah, yeah. No. yeah I hear it. Now you're going to be really amplified. You're going to be deaf. <laughs> so I, 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 I was desperate to get my hands on these books. Um, and eventually I, I resorted to a, a strategy, I suppose you could say was the start of my life in crime. And I stole my mother's library tickets. Um, <laughs> and I would go over to the, the library um, like, the, like the cat in Shrek, you know, with the big eyes, <laughs> the beautiful look. And I was like, I have to get a book for my mum, she's not well. <laughs> and I, don't, I don't know if, if that video is going to do with it. The, 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 there's a, a recurring theme in my standalone novels. It is the, the notion that your sins will find you out. The past is never dead. The past is always there waiting to catch up with you. And indeed, the past eventually caught up with me because a few years ago I, I did an event back at Kakadi Library. And my mum still lived across the road from the Central Library. And so she, she came with me to this event. And amazingly, one or two of the librarians were still there from when I was a kid. You know. At that time, I thought they were ancient. I expect they were probably about 23. <laughs> <laughs> I introduced my mother, and one of them looked a little oddly at my mother and said, Oh, Mrs. McDermott, I thought you were dead. I've <laughs> <laughs> been taken aback. Dead? Why would I be dead? <laughs> and my brain said, Well, oh, what are you being a bedridden invalid? <laughs> Was, that was my life. I mean, I got, um, I, I, you know, I went to the local school. I got sent to high school a year early because the education committee in Fife was doing an experiment to see what would happen if you took the brightest kids from primary schools a year early and sent them to high school. Um, I have to say it wasn't a very good experiment. It didn't really work very well. It produced me and Gordon Brown. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one or two people who did well. <laughs> but uh, it, 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 it meant that I was incredibly young when I went to university, and I think, on balance, it probably might be better if I'd been slightly older. I, uh, I actually don't want you to speak soft speaking for a minute, but there were two, two things. First of all, I'm trying to think of a nerd, like my father, getting together with his buddies to go, you know, read and discuss Robert Burns. It's like. No, I, don't, I can't picture that. Um, the other thing is that I was in a program called SP in New York when I was growing up, Special Progress, so I ended up going to college when I was 16, yeah. which is a terrible thing because then, and I lied a lot of times until I wanted to be younger. Yeah. But, you know, for yes. many years, I just had to be older. Anyhow. Yeah, totally. Um, so, I, mean, I, was, I, I just turned 17 when I went to Oxford. Yeah. You know, and I mean, it's hard. I, could, yeah. I, couldn't even, I couldn't even get a bank card, you know. <laughs> You have to be 18 to get, a, to get a bank guarantee card for your checkbook, you know. So it was, it was crazy. I and just, you're always kind bizarre of... Bizarre life. Yeah, you're always, I think you're always kind of uh, racing then to stay up with the big kids in a yeah. certain way. But uh, it didn't really do you any harm, I don't think, now. You've gotten over that. I've gotten over it. I think, when I, I think when I turned 50, I kind of thought, it's okay, you can relax. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree with you. I think it, it's not true. And I have to do something that's really driving me crazy, and there was no subtle way to do it. So why didn't I take it out before? <coughs> Sorry, <clears throat> very, very classy, right? Oh, yeah. Nice move. Um, Sophisticated New York. Always. Oh, very nice. Born and raised, and yeah. this yeah. is what happened. Um, it's impressive for us who have you know, not had the benefits of a New York upbringing. <laughs> I mean, if you want part of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll um, keep it for later. Thank you. Okay. Not going to be a new piece. Uh, skipping ahead to your years as a journalist. Yeah. Uh, it made me think that there are many, many writers, I can think of crime writers, who have journal, journalism in their background, like Conley or Lipton, and um, how, if you felt that was a help to you writing your books? I don't know. I think it's 
there are some things I took from journalism that were very useful, but they might not necessarily be things that people expect. Um, I suspect that some of us uh, who end up as writers became journalists because we're essentially unemployable. Um, and journalism is very good for the unemployable because it's essentially it's a non-hierarchical world. Um, and also it, there's a lot of variety, so you don't get a chance to get quite so bored as you do in a lot of other jobs. Um, but um, the things that I think I took from journalism um, were the first thing, and that's a really important thing, is the sense that, that it's a job. Writing is a job. It's not a luxury, it's not an indulgence. Um, when the news happens, that's when you have to write the story. You can't go to the news editor and say, I'm not really in the mood to write about the train crash today. You know, I'll, do it like, I'll do it later in the week, so okay. So you can't, you can't do that. And so you learn very quickly that you, know, you have to get something down on paper. And what I learned was you could, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life, you know, if your cat's died or your lover's left you, you can still get 1,500 words down, and if you get 1,500 words down, you can make it better. And so I've, I've, never, I've never, I'm never subscribed to that I have to wait for the news to strike. Mm. You know, writing is my job. When I'm in the time of year where I'm writing a book, that's what I have to do. I have to get up in the morning and go to the office and write. And yeah, some days it's horrible. And yeah, it takes right. forever to write three sentences. But you've got to do it. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that, that journalism gave me was um, because I was, a, I was a news reporter and I did all sorts of stories. I did everything from um, showbiz celebrity stories to, to just hard news stories, breaking news stories. Um, and so I, I had access to a vast range of people's lives. Um, I had the chance to just walk in and out of their lives, the visiting firewoman, you know. And I saw, I, I got all these snapshots of people under pressure, people in extremists people usually suffering some sort of crisis, but I saw their homes, I saw their places of work, I saw how they behaved under pressure. And it gave me this vast database uh, that I could go back to and access when I'm writing a book, and I can think about how I want a character to react, what kind of house are they going to live in, what kind of office are they going to work in, what kind of job are they doing, all of these things I was fortunate enough to get that privileged access to. So that all just went into the filing cabinet in my head that allows me to draw on for writing character. Yeah, I haven't been, I, it's, <clears throat> hearing that's sort of amazing to me, I love that, and I feel completely jealous of it, although I do sneak into people's houses, but I think that, uh, you know, the thing is about... But you me, did your time. You did your time. You know, and, and, and you've been... You, you know I You've been well behaved since. Not really. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I'm going to just move into something else because you talked, of, you started to talk about your process and going to work, it's funny because we were talking about it yesterday in class, how you can't wait for the muse. You know, if you do, you never, it may never come. And it's, I don't it's understand exactly. how people take 10 years to write a book. What are they doing every day? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you should go to one of the art colonies and, and be there with a, a, you know, a very serious literary writer and tell them that, yeah, you're working on your fifth book and it's the five years. You know, I mean, like every year for five yes. years, you turn in a book and they look at you like, because you know, it's five years in there. Well, you don't have to take five years to write a book to write no. good prose. No, I, I agree with you. Yeah. So, yeah. And there are many people in that <laughs> other zone who can, yeah. But I was going to say, you've now, you've written, you said 28 novels, 26 novels. 26 novels. And a book of short stories. You contribute to the paper still. Um, children's book, don't forget the children's oh, book. Oh, I did forget that story. Mm -hmm. That's a great, great, great work of literature. Well. <laughs> <laughs> That should be about 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so since you were talking about going to your office and writing, and since there are many writers in the room, uh, I know the writing process is so sexy and exciting sitting you know, behind your computer. But uh, you, I, like, you, I like to wear lycra and spandex. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picturing it now. I would never be able to read one of your books without that picture. Um, if you could elaborate on your process. You're just right. <laughs> how you, I don't know, how you come to a novel, if you rewrite a lot, all of that sort of stuff. Well, it's, story is what starts me off. Because at the heart of every book that holds a reader's attention, that lives in their imagination, is a story. I believe that we're hardwired for narrative. You see, 
cave paintings before we had li language of telling a story. You know, here's the woolly mammoth. Here's us chasing the woolly mammoth. Here's us killing the woolly mammoth. You know, here's the woolly mammoth for tea. <laughs> and, and, we and we told ourselves stories when, when we had very, very primitive forms of language, and we've always done that because we've always tried to make order out of the chaos that is our world around us. And so, for me, it, it always starts with something that has the potential to be story. It's something that intrigues me, it's something that, that, that interests me, it's something that makes me go, that's weird, or that's really interesting, or I didn't know that. And that starts a kind of what-if process. Well, if that's the case, then what if this were to happen? If this is the case, well, what if this were to happen? And it's often very small things. Honestly, it might be something that happens to me, it might be an anecdote somebody tells me, it might be a throwaway line in a radio programme. But it's something that sets that, that little ticking going on in my head. Um, you know, I, I, for example, this, this book, The Vanishing Point, the, the first start, starting point of this book was about, probably about three or four years ago, maybe more than that. I was coming through O'Hare Airport with my son, and I have knee replacements, so I set off the metal detectors, so I'm immediately a suspect terrorist. Um, but at, at, at O'Hare, the, the system they had up until just last year, when they put the rapid scan machines in, was that if you set the thing off and there wasn't a member of staff who could drag herself away from a conversation about last night with a boyfriend, with a colleague, you were put into this kind of perspex pen in the middle of the security area to await the attentions of somebody uh, who's going to pat you down and indeed pat you up uh, and warn you to see if you really were a terrorist or just, a, you know, a middle-aged broad with fake knees. <laughs> um, but you're not allowed, I was travelling with my son, and he was about six or seven, and you're not allowed to take your child in the box with you. So your child is abandoned, essentially, in a public area, while you're standing there waiting for somebody from the security team to get around to dealing with you. And I was standing there uh, watching my son standing by the, 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 the luggage belt as the carry-on bags came through, and because I have a nasty, devious, twisted mind, I'm thinking, I wonder what would happen if somebody just walked up and I took him by the hand and walked away with him. And that was the starting point for, for the starting point of the book, mm. um, where precisely that happens, and uh, the consequences are pretty dire for everyone concerned. But that's the sort of thing that will set me going, that will set me thinking, what can I do with this? What can I make of this? How can I turn this around so that the everyday or or something that I don't know about suddenly becomes something else. So it starts with story. Very early on in that story process, I know whether it's something that's going to sit with one of my series characters or if it's not. And if it's not going to sit with them, then it's going to be a standalone. Uh, and I alternate series and standalone. I alternate series because I get bored writing the same characters back to back. I discovered this when I finally gave up the day job. Um, and I was writing two Kate Brannigan books back to back, and it was about halfway through the second one, and I just hated this woman. <laughs> I got up every morning and like, I hate you, bitch. <laughs> really annoying me. And it wasn't, it wasn't the character I was having the issue with, it was the boredom fact that I'd, I'd, been, I'd just spent too long in, in one place. That's what I was going to ask you, like, why three series, and why series versus non-series, but you're answering it. Because so. I'm a Gemini, like, Gemini rising, and I get bored very easily. Um, and so, um, I, I, if it's a standalone, uh, if it's a series, if it's going to be a series novel, what I've got is a nexus of characters already in existence. And they have capabilities, and they have limitations. Uh, they, have the, they have ways of behaving. So, you know, like Tony Hill isn't suddenly going to turn into an action hero. You know, he's not suddenly going to be played by Tom Cruise in a movie. Yeah. He's busy playing He's Richard. busy, yeah. Mm. <laughs> he's busy doing other things. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you have to make the story work in terms of, of what your characters historically can do. And the burdens they carry forward from their history into the next book. The standalone, however, doesn't have any of those limitations. The standalone, I can let the story run wild in my head. And start thinking about all the possible places I can take this story. Nothing is off limits in the first stages until I start to think of how it's actually going to work as a story. And then when I get those first senses of how that story is going to work, then I have to start asking myself, whose story is it? Who are these people? And why are they behaving the way they're behaving? Why are they doing this and not that? 
What is it in their history, their personality, that causes them to respond in one particular way rather than another? And so, from that point on, really, both kinds of book form in the same sort of way. It's a sort of, it's a sort of biofeedback loop between story and character, you know, because one informs the other, informs the other, until gradually I can feel this kind of shape starting to take place, and it's a story, and it's people, and I start to hear the voices in my head, and I start to have conversations with them. And luckily I write it down because otherwise I'd be in the rubber room <laughs> existing in this world where I am God. <laughs> Nothing happens without my say-so.